Welcome to another brand new edition of Rip and Rock. I'm Ryan Ripkin, have Rocco DeSangro here, and he is here, don't worry, but I'm doing the rundown here to start off. And uh, this is going to be a quicker episode just because of things we have moving forward, but we'll time, promise time you, constraints. Yeah, time constraints, you know, we're being real. Some of us are working on a uh, Sunday night. Hey, maybe you want to turn your phone off there while we're recording. Classic ESPN. Uh, it's kind of like a Sports Center top 10 sound. That Shout was. out to Cedric Mullins. You want to segue into that? We, we might as well. I'm just doing your job for you. That. You know what, Rock? Good to see you. But anyway, life comes up, everyone, and and we um, and we got to just roll with the punches, right? Uh, we're recording this on Sunday night, really late on Sunday night, but we're sticking to it. And and Rock, what a weekend it was! We're talking about the Seattle Mariners series with the Orioles, and you brought up Cedric Mullins, and you know we're going to dive into how good Cedric is. But what an unbelievable! any for Cedric Mullins, and we'll dive more into that moving forward. The bullpen was really great in games two and three. Can they hold up down the stretch here? We've seen some great flashes. Fujinami being one of those pieces we will dive in and dissect. And the American League East has really become a two-team race with the Toronto Blue Jays kind of just fading out. What's it look like for the Orioles to stay ahead of Tampa Bay moving forward? And just kind of looking around Major League Baseball and seeing what other division races you guys should be following. Uh, have a little bit of Rip's tips. We're staying with it, and we'll preview the Padres and O's and get on out of here. So without further ado, let's jump into the series and, and rock. It's been very interesting to watch, especially when we think about how grueling that Astros series was. Then the guys hop on a plane, get smacked in game one by the Mariners, and then bounce back and win not just one extra inning game, but two. And uh, how about your guy? You're a big Cedric Mullins guy now, aren't you? I've loved Cedric Mullins' game from the moment I started watching him play baseball. And what he did today was simply incredible. Home run robbery in the ninth after entering the game as a defensive replacement in the eighth. And if you haven't seen that catch, uh, I, I stood up out of my chair. And I try not to be a fanboy when it comes to the team and try to be as unbiased as possible. But when something like that happens, when it's an Orioles player, when it's any player, a catch like that made me literally jump out of my seat, go, my goodness, that was unbelievable. And on top of that, not only did he homer once, but he homered twice. I say he homered twice in the 10th because the first one, he hit over the fence. It just—it was just, you know, move the foul pole a little bit. Come on, guys, give him some help there. But but the actual homer, I mean, he just mashed it. And that was after, you know, Bauman gives up a home run, um, wind out of the sails a little bit, it seemed like for those guys. And, you know, it happens. He's not the full-time closer for the team. Felix had the night off, uh, deservedly so. He pitched a gem the night before. So, that happens, and then Mullins, to do what he does in the top of the 10th, big two-run home run, I mean, it was just an adrenaline boost, not only for him, but for the team. And he, he's been doing this in Bowie, making those catches. I mean, the guy is a, I mean, I don't know if we can give him the gold glove this year because the injuries happened and he's missed a little bit of time, but right. if he's healthy this entire season... I mean, he, he, you probably got to give him the gold glove out there in center. Oh, yeah. He's I mean, one, of the, one of the top defensive center fielders, hands down, in the American League. And, and I'd go as far to say in the, in the entire MLB. I'll take it another step forward. He's one of the best two way players in the outfield in all of baseball. Yeah, there you, you go. You know, and that's really. Right out of my mouth. Yeah, the Orioles fans are spoiled from it because he just showed in one inning, in the bottom of the ninth and the top of the tenth, one inning. How much of an impact he can he can make, and the funny thing is he didn't even start the game today, and to be able to come in and make that type of impact, and obviously he's got to be feeling pretty good. His body that that groin issue seems to be behind him. That's the only thing you can hope for, because when Cedric's on the field, he can make plays like that that can just drastically uh, change things in your favor as as an Oriole fan and for the Orioles team. And man, you know, this this team deserves a ton of credit, Rock. And the reason why I bring this up 
is because this series with the Mariners, the Mariners were the hottest team in baseball coming into this. Well, they had won eight in a row. Was that right? Before? Yeah, and I think they had won three in a row at home mm-hmm. entering the game. They had just swept the Padres, I want to say. Correct me if I'm wrong. But I feel like it was San Diego that they swept before they took on uh, the yeah, Orioles. It's, it's trying to You're load. typing with one hand. And I that's know, the hardest I got thing the to mic do. In I know, one hand. man. I know. It's one of the hardest things to do. It should be a sport. But was, that, but uh, you were correct, surprisingly. They swept the Padres, and they had won seven in a row entering the series. So what? They were on a nine-game win streak, or it, sorry, it, an eight-game win streak yep. until the O's won two straight because mm-hmm. they won that first game. Yep. And, it, let, and, and Rip, let, like, let's, let's talk about game two, how they just battled. Cole Irvin is no longer an everyday starter. He's a bullpen guy. They threw him out there to start the game, and... He pitched a phenomenal game. And the bullpen did as well. And that was, I mean, a game like that, a grinded out game on the West Coast, the second day after you get off the jet, you're probably a little sluggish that first day. It showed. I'm not going to make excuses for the team, but I really truly think like a trip out West, like think, think of being a normal person taking a flight out West. Yeah, the time difference, it changes. And it's not, you know, you can fly out at 7 a.m. here and it'll be like, what, like, I don't know. I'm not good with math, but it could still be the morning or the afternoon in California um, or, you know, Washington. And you're still tired, man, because your mental clock is off. And baseball players, yeah, they travel to the West Coast more than we do. And they travel more than we do for sure. But it's still going to have that effect on your mentals and, and your physical ability as well at times on um, being sluggish. So I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not playing the world's smallest violin for the O's, but. Game one, I'm telling you what, they were, I don't want to say jet lagged, but getting off that plane seems sluggish to start, and, and it did definitely show. Uh, credit to the Mariners, though. They're a very good baseball team. Yeah, I mean, the other part, too, is you're saying to keep all that in mind, we're traveling, even though you're traveling on a uh, private plane, you're going out there, that's nice. The time zones you just talked about, but how about the grueling series with the Astros, where you had just a wave of emotions, where you had that heartbreaking game one, you're right in game two until it gets broken open in the eighth. And then you're holding on for dear life in the ninth where, you know, a ball off the glove of Ramon Urias, if it's not deflected, the Astros might have tied that game in game three. So just saying the stressful moments, and then you go and play the hottest team in baseball, the Mariners, who also had a guy on the mound named Luis Castillo, who arguably, because they're out on the West Coast, is is in the Cy Young consideration as well, and he's having a fantastic season, but no one re- would really know that because on the East Coast, let's be honest, those late games, not a lot of us on the East Coast are staying up till those 10 o'clock start times. You might. You're a night. I'm a night out, too. I was about to say, I wasn't going to throw you under the bus there. You're a good kid. It's both of us. That's, but, stop saying that. It's not, It's you know, you overuse that term, number one, and I'm older than you, number two. So would you, you want just me doesn't to, work. We'll call you bud. No, I don't like that. Pal? Nope. Okay. Not your buddy guy. All right. Not, you know, South Park, no? Yes. Did I, you not have a childhood? I, I mean, <laughs> you know, I was gonna, gonna say, so, some things are documented in my childhood. I've actually gotten a lot of <laughs> memories about, like, I remember you being that, you know, running around. I'm like, yep, I know. I was adorable. Um, who cared about the guy that was playing on the field? Yeah, what happened, The little man? kid. You lose the blonde hair. Lo- and then lose Forget the hair. about who you are. Period. Lose oh. the hair. Period. I'm, dude, I'm, I'm right. Be- I mean, right behind you. I feel like we're not too far off as far as the uh, hairline category yeah, goes. We're gonna get some hair sponsors yeah. in here. Hair product yeah. sponsors. But the other thing I wanted to point out with Bosley, the Seattle Mariners team, please sponsor the spot. What? What was that? I'm just trying to sneak something in there. Go ahead. You want to sneak it in? Rogaine, Bosley. Maybe like it's like I'm gonna next time I see my girlfriend next week because she's traveling on the West Coast right now. I'm gonna grab her phone and just. You know, you say things and the targeted ads pop up. Yep. I'm just going to go Bosley, Rogaine, Titleist Golf Clubs. Yep. All three. They're, they, they all go hand in hand and hand. New friends. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, to finish the point of the Mariners, too, which is really impressive, uh, Seattle has the best ERA in all baseball right now. So when people are wondering about what's going on with the bats on the road because of the first two games, Seattle's really good. I mean, Kirby was fantastic in game two, but the most impressive thing, and I tweeted this out, was the Orioles' ability to bounce back and that grid and determination no matter what the circumstance. And you brought up Cole Irving, which I thought was a tremendous point 
because Cole has embraced whatever role the team has asked him to do. Hey, we need you to pitch out of the bullpen. We need you to give us one inning. Uh, we need you to give us three. Hey, we need you to start a game. And you can consider game two as a quote unquote bullpen game because Cole was not stretched out enough to go past five innings. And then you had five more innings of your your guys going out there and just pitching great baseball. And it ended with Felix Batista giving you two innings, shutting down the Mariners, and you and you sneaking out with a victory. Um, you know, it just it speaks volumes. Then in game three, Bradish gives you six from the start. And then again, once again, yes, we can talk about um the home run in the ninth, but overall, this bullpen and Fujinami coming in to close the door. That's just a great sign and showing that the Orioles are finding many different ways to win. You think that, uh, because I didn't see a lot of O's fans like tweet about this unless I just missed it. Do you think Softy, the uh, radio guy in Seattle, was watching that one when Felix Bautista closed it out? Uh, with with oh, yeah. King Felix all over the stadium? What, what, uh, what irony, right? I wonder if that guy was watching. Oh. The one that went up to Bautista and told him the O's social media team needs to knock it off. Wonder if he was watching the series win that the O's just picked up. You know, it's like in Seattle against the Mariners. I mean, I'm just, I'm just wondering. I'm oh, just wondering oh, oh I'm sure just, he didn't. He I watching. saw, I did see a few things. I saw the Mariners broadcast getting upset about, you know, saying the whole King Felix thing. Like it's just, who it's, cares? Well, so that was I my. I want to bring it back up, the, but who cares? Who cares? And here's my thing. I don't really care. Like nicknames are fun, right? They're, they're, yeah. they're, 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 they're more for. They're the enjoyment of even with your peers, with fan bases, whatever it may be. But at the end of the day, like I don't care what someone calls me. But you know what I what I will call Felix Batista? I'll call him the best closer in baseball. I'll call him a Cy Young candidate still. That to me, because that's just a fact. I don't care. You, yeah. you can call him the mountain, Felix, King Felix. Despite what you call him, if you're going to get pressed over a nickname, I mean, you do your thing because I'm just not the type of person to do that. If someone wants to use, you know, a nickname that I had, which I don't like my nickname when I was growing up, I'll give, I'll give you some ammo. It was, it was Rocco Taco. Uh, my friends use your imagination. <laughs> they used to call me something else, but oh. that's like for an R rated podcast. Oh yeah. But you know, it's, if you want to use nicknames, like you got like flash for Dwayne Wade, Miles Garrett uses flash, Josh Gordon used flash. That's just an example. Um, and, and, you know, they go back and forth about it sometimes. I saw Garrett and, and Josh Gordon going back and forth with that um, on Instagram. I think it was a year ago, but it's not a big deal. It's like, let's not get so caught up on a nickname. And, it, it, you know, if you're, if you're a baseball fan, let's get caught up in how good Felix Bautista is, um, how much poise he shows late in innings, despite that. You know, he gives up the grand slam to Kyle Tucker. It's that was I wouldn't even call it a bump in the road. That's like one of those potholes you drive through in in Philadelphia or even here, and you just keep trucking along. It's like they happen. Sometimes it's gonna get a little bumpy. You're not gonna win every single game. He's not gonna, you know, go fifty for fifty in save opportunities or you know some crazy number like that. But what he's able to do, not only at his size, the command he has the speed he throws with, it's impressive. And Felix Bautista should 1,000% still be in the Cy Young race. Oh, I, I, and we're both in agreement with that. And the one thing I'll say with the Astros, I actually talked about this um, with with other people and, and on, on my, my YouTube channel, and it goes hand in hand. The Astros are still the team to beat, by the way. So it, it's not, and that's not a hot take. That's not anything. But I think that everyone still gets caught up with the fact that Houston's not winning their division. So therefore... They aren't as good as they actually are. They're rounded in the form. You know, they just got Verlander. Their offense, as the Orioles found out, is very hard to put away. And actually, if people didn't know this, it's not the first time that Kyle Tucker forced a blown save from Felix Batista. He did it last year in Baltimore. How do I know? Well, if you look it up, yes, you can look up the game. But I was actually at the game. I witnessed it. They're a hard team to put away, right? But it doesn't stop what Felix has done and what he will continue to do. And he's been obviously a huge part of this team. But Felix isn't one guy. I know there's been a constant talk, Rock, about then, can the bullpen hold up? And in the Mets series, before that Astros series, the they, the Orioles bullpen didn't give up, give up an earned run. We talked about it on this pod. Then the Astros series, it was tough, especially in the later innings. And it's definitely highlighted by the, 
the big eighth and ninth innings that the Astros had. But I think what we're seeing is that the Orioles have a lot of good pieces right now, Rock, that can make a good run. Fujinami, even though he's been up and down, he's so close to putting everything together. And I and honestly, he was one strike away three time in his previous outing when when the Astros blew that game open from having another good outing. We're not even talking about uh, him having his struggles. We're seeing that everything's trending in the right direction. Then you're seeing a guy like Perez, who's had struggles so far this season, but now he's starting to find his way. And so the question is going to still loom. Can this bullpen hold up? And we're never, we're not really going to know rock until the time comes. But what we've seen is that they're showing that they are capable and are willing to take on that task of, of handling whatever's thrown at them. And I think it's been great. I mean, heck, did you even know who Jacob Webb was? Before we, uh, well, before the Orioles claimed him? Not really. I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't. No. And how has he been so far with the team? Pretty, pretty damn good. And so the Orioles are finding different ways of guys, and that's what they're going to have to do. And, and that's what they're going to continue to do to have success. And for Fujinami, one thing that I really think is intriguing here is being a starter and then becoming a reliever, usually starters are a lot more comfortable out of the windup or having more time with their delivery. You know, and Fuji, if you see his leg kick, he likes to take his time. It's slow. It's under control. He, he almost like hitches, but he doesn't. It's like he goes up and then he goes in, like in towards his uh, his plant leg. Mm -hmm. And it's his thing. Yeah. That's his thing. Well, and also too, then when there's no one on base, you can have it as long as you want. But as soon as runners are on, you have to speed yourself up a little yeah. bit, right? Because you have to control the run game. And that, that is something that for me, if he can get comfortable with what that is and maybe realize that he can, you know, maybe sacrifice the run game a little bit to make sure he gets the batter, I'd be fine with that. But whatever that balance is, that's really all it is for Fuji. It's that type of consistency because when he is on I mean, look, his stuff speaks for itself. So it should be really fun to see. Um, I love saying his name, Shintaro Fujinami. I just love it. You got it down, too. I do right now. Yeah. Take notes here, Rock. With, with him, though, with Fuji, what I like the most about Sunday's save, not only did he have to come in in a high-pressure situation, and yep. he's done that before, mm -hmm. and I feel like his confidence wavers at times. He has his ups and he has his downs. He's either hit or miss. You don't, you don't know what Fuji right now you're going to get out there. And that can be a problem sometimes. Are we going to get the one that walked the bases loaded and then hit two guys in a row? You don't know. Tonight, we got the good Fuji. The one that's the reason why the Orioles pursued him, went after him, traded for him uh, before the trade deadline. Because they think this guy has potential. He throws gas. It's not a speed thing. It's a location thing. His command. Once he gets his command down though, this guy is going to be the real deal for this ball club. And this game, I I'm so glad for Fuji and his confidence that he came in in the 10th for a save opportunity. Because wh why, you ask? Why do we want a guy who you know, is, is very shaky, is hit or miss sometimes, coming in in the 10th inning, series went on the line to save a game. Because guy on second with those extra inning rules, that's how he starts the game. It's already a high-pressure situation. You already got a guy on base. And he comes in. He did throw a wild pitch to the backstop that allowed the runner to advance to third. But then he took care of business, man. And he's throwing heat out there. So for Fuji, it's a guy you want to root for. It's a guy you want to do well. Because you could see how down he was on himself after he walked the base, you know, after the base is loaded and then he hits two guys in a row. Mm -hmm. um, but the Fuji we got on Sunday was the Fuji that, listen, come postseason, come playoff time, you're going to need that Fuji in the bullpen for sure. Uh, absolutely. No and doubt. he's going to win you games too. Yeah, no doubt he's going to win you games. And then that's something, regardless of it, that's what, whoever the Orioles have, that's who they're left with now. And so I just think it's so great. And I know people are saying, well, 
the bullpen should be better. Well, well, hey, you're seeing what I love is the eye test. Can the bullpen come up in big situations? And the answer is yes. Can Fuji come up in big situations? The answer is yes. Now it is as we move closer, can you continue to refine because there's going to be a margin for error that's going to get smaller as we move into October baseball. And so as we move into this, because we're 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 ripping and rocking through this, and I tried to have a little pun in there. I don't know how that worked I'll out. Be honest it's a, with you guys. This might not be our best episode, but we want to talk about the O's. Yeah. And I mean, we want to get this on. Because <laughs> Ryan comes here, he drives from DC because he had to move away from me because, you know, we're not friends anymore. And we have a small window sometimes on Sundays to record this. So we do what we can. Sometimes episodes are going to be an hour 15. Sometimes they're going to be an hour. Sometimes they're going to be a half hour. Sometimes it is what it is. Yep. And, and honestly, if you could see this and like, it'd be like cueing that music and like, dun, 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 dun. that's how it's kind of felt like tonight where we are literally just running around. Well, I've just been kind of vibing and chilling. Rock, Rock's got to get ready. Uh, he, he's working his butt off. Proud of him. You know, he is a good guy. Good guy, Rock. But anyway, really quickly, I want to talk about the, the races in, in baseball right now. And the American League East, though, specifically, has truly become a two-team race. And I wanted to hold off for going into this weekend because if the Orioles had stumbled and the, and the Blue Jays had played better against the Cubs. We might be having a different conversation, Rock. But the Blue Jays lost the series against the Cubs. The Orioles won the series against the Mariners. Now the Blue Jays are eight games back with about a month and a half to go, and that's a large number to try to overcome. And then there's the Tampa Bay Rays sitting three games back. So, yes, so you're telling me there's a chance with the Blue Jays? Sure, but the the team to me that really could still catch the Orioles are the Tampa Bay Rays, but they are really hurting right now for a lot of different reasons. No, no yeah, well, I don't want to make a joke out of this because it's not. It's all, It always sucks seeing a guy get hurt, and but like you're saying they're hurting. They, they literally are, especially in the starting rotation. Yep. McClanahan, that's tough. Well, that, that's that's the thing right there. When people, when I talk about you can try to replace certain guys, you can't. Like Cedric Mullins, there's still there's only to a certain extent that you can replace Cedric, a Cy Young caliber pitcher like Shane McClanahan. That is extremely challenging to to change because that's a guy. Every time he gets the ball, you feel good about your chances of winning the ball game. And now he's gone. But for the Orioles and for the rest of the regular season, yeah. he's gone. That's like that's. Most likely, his, even if they make the playoffs, it does not look like McClanahan is going to pitch again in 2023. And the Orioles now, they're in great position then to find a way. Now you got to continue it out through this road trip on the road, then come back home and you're going to play those Toronto Blue Jays. That could really be the final blow when the Orioles really have put it to Toronto this year, but that would just be the cherry on top. But other races you guys should probably consider looking at if you are baseball fans like we are, Twins and Guardians separated by four and a half games, but I think the Twins are starting to show that they feel really good and they're starting to pick it up. Their pitching staff's always been very solid this season. Uh, on the in the National League side, you know, the Braves are running away. Dodgers are starting to push ahead eight and a half up, but watch that NL Central. The Brewers, yes, are leading the division, but the Cubs and the Reds sit three and a half back. That should be a blast to watch. And the Cubs, I love the fact that they didn't sell and Cody Bellinger's still there and their team is making this a race. I love that. I just, I wish there'd be more. It's not the end off, you know, when your division, but I just always growing up for me, that was something watching divisional races. So those are ones that you should monitor. Obviously we care about the O's the most here. So those are the ones you're going to hear about. And that's going to lead into rips tips sponsored by me. Sponsored by nobody sponsored by me. Shout out me. Can't sponsor your own segments. Hey, yeah, you can. They can sponsor whatever you want to sponsor here. But Rips Tips, I think what we're trying to to establish here is stay or one one thing. If you've heard me talk about Fuji or a lot of other guys, I don't like to get negative on a lot of players. I like to be objective and talk about what's going on. But just because things are going wrong does not mean you turn your backs on them when things aren't going their way. And so for a guy like Fuji, where I felt like a lot of people have said you can't trust him and you get very emotional about the moments and I get it it's hard when you especially want your team to win and it can be frustrating but realize how many great things that these guys are doing and they're going to have great days you know okay days awful days but there's su the support to stay with them through it because you're going to see it pay off I've talked about it earlier in the season the patience to wait for guys like Kyle Bradish and Dean Kramer they've been tremendous for this team 
Gunnar Henderson figuring it out. Not that everyone was really harping on Gunnar, but you saw a guy go through his struggles and start to figure out who he is, and that is he can be one of the best third baseman shortstops in all of baseball. Um, so I just want to preface that no matter what's going on, keep the faith with the guys that you root for and keep the faith with, with anyone in your life with that too. You know, don't, don't let people, um, how do I want to word this? When people are going through those times, realize, stick with them. Those, your friends, your family, stick with them through the tough times. That's going to make it better. Uh, that's all I got for the rips tips for this week. Um, I know we're moving on this one today. Moving I'm and grooving. Moving and grooving. How's it sound so far? It sounds all right? Sounds all right. You should, yeah, you, levels look great. I don't think I uh, messed anything up. So uh, I mean, not, that, not r- yet. Really, so before we go, because 1023, I go on in about seven minutes. We're, we're honest here. So, we're, yeah, we, we are, are honest. We, we're very transparent. Next week's episode, we are going to, it's going to be 20 times better. Not that, the, I don't think this is a bad episode. We talked about a lot of good stuff, but it's going to be more content. We're going we're gonna to throw a lot more content out there. Um, two predictions we had earlier in the season, real quick. I, ju- I just want to, I'm wondering if you want to stick with them, go back on them, or, I don't know, change them or not. Um, Jackson Holiday getting called up this year. And I, I for as far as, as far as he goes, I mean, he, he's been just, everywhere he goes, this dude is nuts. He's just unbelievable. Five hit game in Bowie. Um, then he has another multi-hit game. He cannot stop hitting the baseball. I don't think he gets called up this season. I still truly feel like they're going to kind of work him up through the through the ranks, uh, go to AAA, do his time there, and then he's going to get called up next year, whether that's before the All-Star break or after the All-Star break. I believe Jackson Holiday will be an Oriole in, in 2024. Heston Kerstad, though, I'm kind of, I'm not surprised he hasn't been called up yet, but like with the injuries in the outfield, Hicks goes down, Mullins goes down, they miss time. That would it seemed like it would have been the perfect time to to bring Kerstad up and kind of work him into the lineup and get him primed for a postseason run. I mean, that's I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I'll say this. I think Jackson Holiday, his future is so bright. I still think when everyone looks at the comparisons with Manny Machado getting called up from Double A when the Orioles were making a playoff push, and this is no knock to Jackson. Manny at that time, his defense was so elite, and the Orioles needed that defensive spot at third base, even though Manny could hit, and we've seen it, obviously, how his, how his uh, career has taken off since then. Um, but for Jackson, I still think 2024 is going to be the year, and we've been really spot on with that, Rock, from the beginning. So we'll we'll, we'll show you guys the video, videos again. We have the receipts for it, but all in all, it's no knock to Jackson, but looking out at the construction of the Orioles roster, that's the way it looks like it's going to be. And for Heston Kerstad, I think, because if he's going to be on the, on the roster, possibly for the postseason, he's got to be up by a certain date. I think it's right around September 1st. So I think Heston's time, they're going to have to make the decision. I think it has to be by then. Because I feel like his bat is just too good to not have on, not have the ability to be on your postseason roster. So to answer both those questions, that's what I got for you. Um, and then lastly, I want to just preview the Padres real quick. And this is going to be probably a minute here. But I want people to understand, Padres aren't out of the race. You know, believe it or not, as disappointed of a season that they've had, they are still hanging on to hope to make the playoffs. And as we figured out, especially with last year's playoffs, all you got to do is get in. All you got to do is get into the dance and see what happens. And the Padres, as I am speaking at this moment on Sunday night... Well, they just lost. To, well, and I know, I, I agree. I still... I'm a firm believer that they don't make the postseason this, this oh, year. Oh, no, I'm not, I'm not saying it's not an uphill battle, but they're not dead. They're five and a half out of the wild card spot, and you would have thought, as disappointed of a season that they've had, that this would be all said and done. It's not all said and done yet, so the series with San, the series with San Diego is just going to mean just as much to them as it does mean to Baltimore, so stay tuned for that, and a lot of star power should be fun I think that's all I got for right now, Rock. Any closing words? No, I think that's all I got as well. We, um, you know, it was a fun game. It was a fun series. And uh, Cedric Mullins just doing what Cedric Mullins does. I think it's, you know, continues to only be up from here for the Orioles. If you're a doubter out there and you're waiting for them to fall off, 
I don't think it's happening anytime soon. I think this team is just on such an upwards trajectory right now. They're playing some phenomenal baseball. They've shown Major League Baseball that they're here to stay, and, and they're contenders. Yeah. I, I wasn't sure at first. I wasn't sure if there was going to be a drop-off in the second half of the season. There hasn't been. And they are doing it with not the most talented roster in Major League Baseball. That is not a knock to any of the players on the team. But you look at some of these rosters, the Dodgers, the Braves, top to bottom. What the O's are doing right now with the roster they have and the guys they have is so impressive because it's a new person stepping up every night. And that's what you're going to need come the end of the season. We said it in episode one. I said, are the O's a team of destiny with the Homer hose, with the celebrations, with the people they had on this team, they just have fun. I truly still feel like this team currently is the team of destiny this season. I agree, and, and I think that we might have fun in the future. Uh, Rock and I, we, we like to mess around, and we're going to have so many more of these episodes. Can't wait to show and talk more with you in the future. As always, everyone, uh, go to Apple, Spotify, Amazon, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. Smooth. You got it down this time. Rate and review. Please let us know what we can do better. Ryan Ripkin on Twitter or X now, Rocco DeSangro no, as well. No, no, we're calling it Twitter, man. Okay. We're not those X, people. X, Twitter, whatever it is, that's where you can find X. us. No. But that is it for this episode. Sorry for the quickness. That's how life goes. You, you guys that. enjoy your week, and we will see you just, next just, Sunday. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Real, real quick before we go. Question, question, question. If if I'm supposed to have tweets when I tweet, what am I going to call them on X? Okay. Yeah, okay. All right. See you guys we'll later. We'll see you next Tune week. Tune in next week for a brand new episode of Rip and Rock. Appreciate it. Yeah.